He's a political activist. He believes in the mission of move to amend is the most important issue of our time. And our democracy depends on its success. Tonight he will share the, that mission and it's important. Um, please wel welcome Rick. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start with something profound, and I always warn people before I say anything profound, because I don't say profound things very often, and it's this. I must do something will always accomplish more than saying something must be done. And that's profound. And the reason I'm starting with that tonight is by the time I'm finished, I'm going to be asking you to do something. If what I propose to you seems reasonable in your mind, I am going to ask for the order at the end of my talk, so you've been forewarned. Now, this whole thing began with just three words. It created the foundation for the document that would literally uphold the greatest experiment in self-governance that the history of mankind has ever known. Just three words protected the rights of all the people within that government, and those three words are, we the people. It's actually kind of fun to say. Go ahead, say it with me. We the people. Now think about that. We the people. In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure liberty for ourselves and our posterity, we ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. We the people. And that's important because we the people are the only group left that has any power to keep America on the course that our founding fathers set it upon. It really comes down to you and I. And any time we try to do anything of, of substance politically, like an amendment to the United States Constitution, it has to start at this level. You can't start at the upper levels of national politics or even state politics because the politicians that you would rely on to make this movement start have a dog in the fight. They're just a little bit too close to the money for my liking. And that's creating a big problem for democracy as we know it. Now, when you look at, at We the People, um, it was Alexander Hamilton said, the sacred, right, the sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for amongst old parchments or, or musty records. But it is written as with a sunbeam upon the entire volume of human nature by the divinity, the hand of the divinity itself, and cannot be erased or obscured by mortal power. That means this sacred right of mankind is not man given or man ordained, it is God given. God gave these rights to mankind upon his creation. And now what we're doing in the United States is making a determination as to who's going to get to call the shots in this country. Is it going to be the well-heeled, the multinational, the transnational corporations, or is it going to be we the people? I'm going to contest you tonight, and I'm going to show you some evidence that I really don't believe we have too much government. I believe we have too much influence of big business in our government, and we don't have enough influence of we the people in our government. So when we look at this, we're going to be talking about the mission of Move to Amend. Now, the mission of Move to Amend is to create a, an amendment to the United States Constitution that has two parts. Number one, only human beings, not corporations, not unions, not nonprofits or other such organizations should be entitled personhood rights. And number two, money is not free speech. It's property. And therefore, the regulation or the control of money into the political process is not an unconstitutional act. And I think that is really the foundational point of what's going on in today's democracy. Because I don't care what your issue is. I don't care if your issue is same-sex marriage. I don't care if it's tax reform. I don't care if it's gun controls. I don't care if it's whatever you might have as an issue. Nothing is going to change until we get the money out of the politics and get the money away from the politicians. Because it's corrupting the system. Now we're going to be talking about some key words here. Um, one of those words, oh, got my pen here, is, I've already mentioned a few times, democracy. And when we're talking about we the people, one thing I want to explain, 
Move to amend is probably the most bipartisan issue that's in existence in politics today. To give you an example, I think now Wisconsin has got 26 to 27 communities that have either resolved or through uh, a, a vote, a referendum vote, have agreed to stand with move to amend to compel the state of Wisconsin to become an additional state that is committed to this process. To give you an example, it passed with 87% in Dane County. And then it turned around and passed with 72% in Waukesha County. There's nothing that's this bipartisan in politics. There's nothing even remotely close. Because this is an issue that affects we the people and it has to be, it has to come to the forefront where the people of the United States get to, by referendum vote, make this decision. And we have to take this decision away from the politicians. That's what the mission is all about. Now when we talk about democracy, anybody know where democracy comes from? What, what language? Greek. It's Greek. Very good. It's Greek. Two parts. Demos, people. Kratia, rule. This literally means the people rule. Think about that. The people rule. How many of you think the people rule in the United States today? <laughs> At least I'm not going to get knocked over by the breeze coming up as everybody's waving their hands wildly out here. The people rule. That's the way our founding fathers set this up. They were, for the most part, by and large, students of enlightenment. The concept that man could govern himself and through a collective agreement amongst the peoples could then put forth laws and controls that would create a tranquil, peaceful, and productive society. The people rule. Now, another what we're going to talk about is legal personhood. Legal personhood primarily is the ability to assert rights. And not just assert rights, but to have your rights recognized by the United States Constitution. And more important, to have those rights protected by the United States Constitution. The history of America is little more than a series of struggles by one group after another, by one person after another, to achieve legal personhood. This is the holy grail in a self-governing democracy, is the rights of the people to govern themselves and the rights of the people to have their privacy. So legal personhood is a pretty big thing. And up until just recently, the only group that had been afforded personhood rights were God-made men and women. There weren't any man-made entities that had that distinction. We're going to talk a little bit about another word. In fact, we're going to talk a lot about another word. Corporation. Anybody know where this word comes from? It's Latin. Two components. Corpus. Body. The suffix basically means to be made or created with the inherent qualities of. So to be made or created with the inherent qualities of what? Body. That's all a corporation is. Any lawyers in here at all? Anyone who studied law, the first thing they'll teach you in law school when you get to corporations is a corporation is referred to as a legal fiction. It's a concept that brings people, groups, and resources together to achieve a purpose, a legal fiction. Now, I'm not a Rhodes Scholar, but I'm pretty familiar with the grasp of what the word fiction means. It's, it's made up. It's make-believe. It's something that doesn't really exist in, in the concrete manifested world. So that's one of the things we have to keep in mind on here, too. Now, it is fitting that the word corporation is Latin because the very first corporations, they were Latin. How many of you heard the saying, all, all roads lead to Rome? You ever heard that one before? Corporations. The very first corporations were taking place in the Roman Republic before it became the Roman Empire. That's an important point to consider as well. 
because there is a sizable difference in transformation that goes on in a country when it moves from being a republic to an empire. And that's a question we really need to start thinking seriously about as to where America is headed with its policies currently. But these corporations were formed to build the viaducts, build the water systems, bringing water into cities with no electric or hydraulic pumps. Think about the, the intellectual capacity that had to go into doing that, building the roads, the universities, the hospitals. All those organizations were the first corporations that really were in existence. And they had this great concept. They took private money and resources, pooled it together, and then put it towards a public use. Sounds a little mixed up, doesn't it? Because it sure isn't the model for today's transnational corporation, where they take basically pool together private money, or pool together public money, and then appoint it to a private profit use. And I want to make one clarification when I'm talking about corporations. There's a big distinction between a local corporation, a locally owned business and corporation, and a transnational corporation. You got plenty of local corporations in this community that are wonderful citizens. They, so they pay taxes, they support the community, they sponsor baseball leagues and, and other youth activities. They do wonderful jobs and they're wonderful citizens. When was the last time you saw a youth baseball league that was sponsored by Exxon? Or Walmart? Or General Electric? As far as being good citizens, in 2012, General Electric had revenues of 19 billion with a B dollars and paid zero in taxes. In fact, by the time their attorneys got done, they actually qualified for a $126 million refund on their taxes. That's not good citizenship. And what has happened is we have allowed our laws to change to favor big business, multinational, transnational corporations to the point where we have lost our connection to the public good. And what's the public good? It's roads and infrastructures. It's educational systems. It's hospitals. It's any number of electrical grid systems and gas providing systems and, and any number of things that help to better the lives of the people within a community. And those common goods are vitally important. But they're all right now under the duress of being privatized and turned into a motive for profit. And that's a big problem. I got a big problem with that. But those, those corporations were largely doing very good things in the Roman Republic. And then time expired, you know, and these, the concepts were combined with the, the greed of man. And by the 15th, 16th century, we saw a different kind of corporation emerge. And this was primarily during the age of discovery. When uh, Great Britain was in their, in their discovery period, what were they discovering? They were discovering Africa, and they were discovering India, and they were discovering all the resources that these countries had. Well, guess what? If you show up somewhere and there are people there, you didn't discover it. You just ran into it. That's all that happened. But what they did was they created a company called the East India Company. The East India Company was built as an instrument of empire. Its original purpose was to militarily destroy the subcontinent of India, and to replace their educational institutions and all their cultural institutions with a new story and with a new direction. And at the same time, let's pull all the resources out, and those will go back to the shareholders of that corporation, which was the aristocracy at the time. Keep in mind what our forefathers fled from when they left England. They were fleeing an aristocratic society where you had the, arist the aristocratic elite here and you had everybody else down here. There was no middle ground. Is that getting to sound familiar nowadays? Mm -hmm. We're seeing the, the constant pressure and squeezing the middle class and the violent rattling shaking of it where most people are falling to the bottom, but very few are escaping up higher than that. And upward mobility is becoming a thing of the past. So that, that's what they were fleeing from. Well, who are the shareholders? of the East India Corporation. The king and the parliament and all the aristocrats who, were, who controlled the corporation. And when people look at, at what happened in, in the United States of America when the Boston Tea Party took place. Now, if I ask you right now, why did they throw all the tea into the harbor? What was their reason? Go ahead, you can jump in anytime. Taxes, most people think it's taxation without representation. 
Interesting thing about the Boston Tea Party, there was only one company that had its, ship car its ship's cargo thrown into the bay, East India Company, because the king had informed America that all business would be handled through the East India Company and they would be putting tariffs and costs and charges on everything that was shipped, all goods that were shipped out for world distribution would go through the East India Company, anything you bought would come into you through the East India Company. The Boston Tea Party was as much a revolt against a hostile corporate takeover of American businesses as it was about taxation without representation. Now when you look at a, at a corporation, in order to be, to, to get incorporated, You had to go through a number of steps in the early part of the country. In, in the first 75 years of the United States of America, the first thing that you had to do to be incorporated was your corporate plan had to serve a public good or it didn't get chartered. And that's what they referred to, to a corporation as, as a chartering. So if you didn't serve a public good, you're, you're dead on arrival. It wasn't going to happen. Now, if you did serve a public good, the first thing that would happen in the state that you wanted to be chartered in you would present your case to the lower house of government for that state, the assembly. If the assembly viewed the merits of, the, of your application and voted favorably, you would then move on to the upper chamber of the house into the senate of that state. And if you were viewed favorably there and you passed through that hurdle, you would then move on to the governor for his signature. What does that sound like? It sounds like the way we make laws. That was what you had to do to be a corporation in the first 75 years of this country. That's what you had to go through in order to accomplish that task. Well, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty amazing hurdle. The other thing is during that first 75 years, your corporation could have a life of 20 years. After 20 years, your corporation was dissolved. It was no more. Now, you could continue in business, but you could no longer continue in business under the protections of limited liability. And that was designed so that businesses, as they got bigger and financially stronger and more massive, that they couldn't run slipshod over the population and still be protected under limited liabilities for things like infractions against public rights, uh, environmental issues, workers' issues, safety issues, things like that. That if, as they got stronger and more massive, that if you're going to continue with your business, you're going to have to be, you're going to have to self-regulate and you're going to have to be a good citizen because your charter's just been dissolved. Nowadays, for the low cost of $378, I can go to LegalZoom, I can fill out all the paperwork, I can get my rubber stamp and my paperwork and my book and everything, my seal, and I can be incorporated, and as long as I continue to hold minutes and hold up to the elements and the, the loose-knit restrictions that are currently required for chartering a corporation, that corporation can last pretty much into perpetuity. It can, it can go as long as I do, maybe longer. But it wasn't that way during the first 75 years of this country. In fact, up till 1954, there was still one state in the United States where it was a felony for a corporation to use a single dollar out of its coffers to influence the political process. Anybody know what state was the last one to? Wisconsin. Wisconsin, it was us. We were the last ones to hold on to that. How far, how far has it fallen? where the rights of the people no longer are, are being upheld, but the rights of the, of the CEOs of transnational corporations, the rights of the well-heeled. Just came out today, in fact, uh, the Pope was talking about it today, that the World Financial Reports came out, and right now, 85 people control as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the entire population of the world. 85 people. In the United States, 40 families control as much wealth as the bottom half of the United States population. For every dollar held in the possession of that top 1%, excuse me, of that bottom half, that top level has $375,000 for every dollar held within that bottom half of the population. No society, no democracy can long endure and sustain that type of inequality within its structure. And when you look at, at what happened with, with corporations, we can go back to uh, when Ronald Reagan took office as President of the United States, 
The highest tax rate was 79%. And it did some very good things. Corporate CEOs who were in, in really in just, um, um, just stacking up enormous amounts of cash and, and uh, in fact, surplus. But they weren't taking out of the corporation. Why are they going to take it out? I'm going to lose 80 cents on every dollar I take out after, after a $3 million exemption. So I'm going to leave the money in my corporation. I'm going to use it for research and development. I'm going to improve wages. I'm going to make people happy in their work. I'm going to improve uh, safety in, in the plant. And I'm going to reinvest in my business. Well, President Reagan dropped that rate down, I believe it was 28%. was where it dropped down to. And the first thing that started happening is CEO saying, hey, now we can take it with us. And we're only going to lose 28 cents on a dollar. And what you, now you started seeing was those CEOs and those board of directors and those shareholders taking immense amounts of cash out of those businesses for their own personal enrichment and then letting those businesses decay and deteriorate and fall by the wayside. And it also hurt the buying power of the American public. It just seems kind of wrong-headed to me that we continue to squeeze everything out of the middle class, which is the engine of uh, the economic society that we have. And when you're in a free market economy, 70% of the United States economy is dependent on the purchase of goods and services. And the largest purchasing block of those goods and services is the middle class. Well, over the last 35, 40 years of squeezing that middle class, we've reduced the buying power of that public to now where they can't go out and afford the goods and services. You know, when we started out this country, we had a lot of cheap labor. They're called slaves. We have never really in this country overcome the problem of slavery. We've just simply moved it offshore by trade agreements with other countries that are paying pennies on a day, a dollar a day wages, that don't have any safety conditions, that are working in absolutely inhuman conditions. All we have done with America is we've washed our own conscience, conscience by moving our slavery issue offshore. And now it's come back to bite us because now we're working in a global economy. We're all in the same pond together. And now what's happening is those wages are now being used as the standard overseas and now America is supposed to drop its wages to be competitive with that. Does, does that create a problem with anybody here? That creates a big problem with me. And this happens as corporations gain more power, gain more influence over the political process, and they can pass laws that advance their cause. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, this was back in I want to say 1997, um, Richard DeVos, who's the founder of Amway Corporation, contributed $500,000 as a soft money contribution to the Republican National Committee. And his wife donated $500,000 in soft money contribution to the Republican National Committee. Now during that year, Trent Lott and Newt Gingrich got together, literally in the middle of the night, and added a bill into the massive 1997 tax bill. And if, if I read it to you, you'd scratch your head and you'd say, what does that mean? Because nobody can figure it out. But what it ended up doing was it ended up saving Amway Corporation $19 million on its taxes that year. And every corporation that is, was big enough to qualify got the same tax break. And the only reason Bill Clinton didn't say anything about it, because Bill Clinton invented the game the year before when he was building his war chest for his reelection campaign. Politicians from both sides of the aisle, so far into the money, they really can't relate to what's going on with you and I. Uh, just to give you a comparison of, of corporate power, how it affects local issues and local politics, I can remember a day when we didn't have Walmarts. <laughs> and I kind of like the memory, to be honest with you. But communities have fallen all over themselves to bring Walmart into the community, offer them tax incentives through TIF districts and tax abatement programs, saves them tons and tons of money to come in here so the first thing they can do is wipe out all the local mom and pop shops that provided goods and services to that community before and those businesses are now gone. And they can replace it with a bunch of low wage, high turnover jobs that don't provide benefits. While communities are giving tax breaks and TIF districts and tax abatement programs to Walmart, 
the largest drawing block of collective people drawing money out of Badger Care, which is Wisconsin's version of Medicaid right now, is Walmart employees. The world's largest employer making enormous profits doesn't see fit to pay their employees a living wage, nor to provide them with the benefits of health insurance and access to the health system that America has. But look how much tax money goes out the door to help them come into our communities. I'll give you one other example of, of what's going on. And this involves the post office. How many of you thought cutting Saturday delivery for the post office was a good idea? Glad to see we haven't got a lot of hands going up. Now, the post office is a branch of government. In fact, it's the only civilian employed branch of government that is specifically mentioned in the United States Constitution. Article 8 mentions the United States Post Office in the Constitution. And we've heard all this money, all this, all this cry about how much money the post office is losing and how far in the hole that they are. A couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, the post office has existed on nothing more than the money generated from stamps and postage and has not taken a single dime from taxpayers in its existence. Number two is the post office has a sacred promise to the citizens of the United States that if you have an address and you have mail that has been sent to you, it will be delivered universally six days a week to your address, not based on profit, not based on advantage. That's a solemn promise. In 2006, Darrell Issa, in a lame duck session of Congress, passed a poison pill law that affected the post office that requires the Postal Control Act that requires the United States Postal Service to prepay its retirement benefits 75 years into the future during the next 10 year window. No business in the history of mankind, no branch of government in the history of this country has ever been asked to do such a thing. In fact, the post office is being forced not only to pay for benefits for people who weren't even working for the post office yet, they're required to pay benefits for people who weren't even born yet. And it was all designed to bankrupt the United States Postal Service so that multi-billion dollar business could be handed over to corporate players like FedEx and UPS. Today, the last mile delivery for up to 29% of FedEx and UPS deliveries are handled by the United States Post Office. Reason being, we can't make any money if we've got to send that package 28 miles out of town to Joe Smith's house. So if you allow your postal service to be undermined by politicians who are lining their pockets in the process and replace that with a private enterprise, for those of you who live in rural areas, good luck. You're not going to get your mail every day. You might get it twice a week, and you're going to have to drive into town to get it. Because if they can't make a profit providing your mail for you, they simply aren't going to bring it to you. That's the difference between the common good and the mindset of a transnational, multinational corporation whose only purpose, let's face it, is profit. That's all it's there for is to make profit. After that, it has, it, it has literally no purpose beyond that. So, if we look at the, um, at the Constitution and, and finding out where do corporations belong, do they belong with personhood rights, or they, do, do they not qualify for personhood rights? If we look at the U.S. Constitution, two players in the Constitution, we the people, we're the big guys. We get mentioned first. We have the power. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. We the people. We the people have the power. The other player is government. And there are some distinct differences between these two players. For one thing, we the people are free and we are sovereign. We control our destiny. We have freedom. Now, is government free and sovereign? No. Government is subordinate and accountable. Who is government subordinate to? People. We the people. Government has to do what we the people want, and if it doesn't do what we the people want, then we should use our power and authority and change the players. Who are they accountable to? They're accountable to we the people. We expect certain things out of government. When we pay taxes, 
We do that because we want to live in a free, peaceful, and productive society. And there is a certain cost that comes with that. So we pay taxes. We want certain things for that. We want, we want certain accomplishments for that. We want to have certain rights for that. So they are accountable. And that brings us to, and we do have rights. Right in the Constitution. In fact, I, I encourage all of you to go home tonight, read the Constitution. You can Google it. The first section of the Constitution are the articles of the Constitution. It basically explains how the government is set up, the, 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 different system, the different players in the government as far as their checks and balances, how representatives are elected, how, how everything is set up for the government. But when you get to the first ten amendments, that's your Bill of Rights. Read that. You'd, you'll feel better after you get done reading that because you're going to feel more powerful after you get done reading that Bill of Rights because they're talking about you and you, and you, and you. Those are your rights. So we have rights. What does the government have? Government doesn't have rights. Government has duties. Set forth by what we the people want to see the direction of the government take. So we're free and sovereign. Government is subordinate and accountable. We have rights. Government has duties. We are private. <clears throat> and have rights of privacy. Is that the government? Certainly isn't today. <laughs> the government has to serve a public interest. Has to serve a public interest. So the government is subordinate and accountable, which gives them duties to perform in the public interest that help make the private lives of the citizenry, of we the people, better, supports their rights, and increases the freedom and sovereignty of the American people. Just goes in a big circle. We the people return the power back to the government through voting and through supporting different things that we want to see happen within that government. Now we look at a corporation. Is a corporation free and sovereign? No. A corporation is subordinate and accountable. To who? Shareholders? Its board? Its officers? Sometimes it's employees, not, not very often anymore, but it is subordinate and accountable, so it doesn't pass that test. Do corporations have rights? Well, for the last four years, the answer to that, unfortunately, is yes, corporations have been given certain personhood rights, and that's where the problem lies. But for the most part, corporations have duties. They've got things they have to perform. They've got work they've got to accomplish. They've got things they have to bring into the real world, whether it's a, a product or a service, has to be brought to the market, has to be sold, has to have a profit motive and a profit achievement to it. So, has duties. And it used to be the corporations had to serve a public interest. That's no longer a requirement of corporations. But during the first 75 years of this country, it was a requirement. And is, if you were in the, in the middle of your 20-year corporate life, and you no longer serve the public good, you got your charter pulled, and you, longer, you could no longer operate under the protections of limited liability. So a lot has changed since this country, and really this country goes in cycles about every 80 years. If you look at the major financial catastrophes of the United States of America, it happens about every 80 years. We had the last one during the late 20s and 30s, and we're going through that again. Why? Because every time the inequality gap begins to expand rapidly, it wakes the people up. We the people, we get woke up, and we get politically active, and we start electing politicians who are going to do our bidding, and we create a corrective action. But unfortunately, the American people have two issues. They're trusting, and they're like electricity. They follow the path of least resistance. So after we do the corrective action, after some years have gone by, some things have changed, we're trusting our politicians to operate in our best interests, and little by little those best interests are diminished, and we start to see laws passed that don't serve the public interest, don't serve the public good, but instead begin to transfer power again into the very wealthy and the transnationals. And then it comes into the forefront where we have a big separation of equality and income equality, things like that, and the people wake up again and address it. 
That's why we think it's so important at this juncture in American history that we have an amendment to correct this action. What can you do? I told you I was going to ask for the order, didn't I? <laughs> well, the way that we've been doing this in Wisconsin with Move to Amend is we've been going primarily to the small towns, villages, local jurisdictions, and talking to their boards, township boards, village boards, things like that, to get them to pass a resolution that supports the Move to Amendment cause. Or we are going out where we've got large enough jurisdictions where we can get a referendum put on, a referendum issue put in the election on the ballot, then we will go out and we've got a canvas to get a certain amount of signatures to force that item to be put on the ballot. But in every community where we've been successful in, in petitioning the citizenry to force this issue on the ballot, and it showed up on the ballot in every community, it's always won. Always. Minimum 72% up to 87% passage rate. Nothing else in politics touches that. What am I going to ask you to do tonight? I'm going to ask you to get involved with us. the very least, talk to people about it. Bring it up to people. Mention to them that there's a need for this to happen. And the other thing is if you can see to donate any of your time to the cause, whether it's going to a town meeting. If you're, if you're a member of that town, you're a resident of that town, showing up at the meeting and saying, I'd like to see my township, I'd like to see my village, I'd like to see my city be a part of this and pass this resolution and not be behind the line of history in what needs to be done. If you can go out when we're, do, when we're working on cities and knock on some doors and petition, every time I've gone out and petitioned, out of every house that somebody answers the door, I will get at least six out of 10 to sign the petition. I'm constantly encouraged everywhere I go. This is important work. I feel good about signing this. I thank you for coming out and getting this petition in front of me. It's extremely rewarding work, but it's, and it's necessary work too. So if at all you have time to, to get involved in this movement, at the very least, talk to your friends and neighbors, your relatives about it and let them know because most people don't realize that this is actually going on. It's still in the shadows, but it won't be for long. When we get to the 37 states, we then have enough states signed on board that we can force it onto a national election. And the one thing I can guarantee, and there aren't too many guarantees in politics, one thing I can guarantee you, you put this issue in front of the entire population of the United States, not only does it win, it wins with such an enormous majority that it will literally scare the last three years' life out of just about any politician currently in office. Because that kind of force, that kind of power, that kind of groundswell and, and togetherness is a pretty scary thing to a politician. They tend to watch more of the polls. Is there any questions anybody has? Yes? The primary advantage of a corporation for the owners of that corporation and the officers of that corporation is they operate under what's referred to as limited liability, meaning if, let's say their corporation, well, we'll use the example that uh, just happened in West Virginia with the contamination of all the water wells down there. You got a corporation out there, you got a CEO who's a multimillionaire, he's, he's not worried about his kids, his grandkids, or anything else going on. He's, got, he's accrued a tremendous wealth through the corporation. Now his corporation has screwed up and harmed nine counties and I think a third of the water supply of the state of West Virginia. It's phenomenal. What that means is that they can go and sue the corporation, but they can't sue him personally and they can't take his wealth that he's accumulated through that corporation being in business. They can't take that from him. That's pretty serious protection, especially when you've got a, a business or an enterprise that has a potential to harm people or the environment or anything else for that matter. Just that limited liability protection is a very tremendous asset. And it's, it's and I guess the, the response of the company that had the chemical spill in West Virginia was to declare bankruptcy right away and try and skip town. They actually transferred most of the assets from the company that did the damage 
to another company that was a startup, uh, figuring we could just transfer all this money out here, and when they sue this company, there's nothing there anyways. We've moved it all out. I don't think that stuff should be going on in the United States. Well, I appreciate you guys putting up with me for the, the time that you have. I want to speak to you ladies and gentlemen tonight about the danger threatening representative government. The basic principle of this government is the will of the people. A system was devised by its founders which seemed to ensure the means of ascertaining that will and of enacting it into legislation and supporting it through the administration of the law. This was to be accomplished by electing men and these days women as well, to make and men and women to execute the laws. Who would represent in the laws so made and executed the will of the people? This was the establishment of a representative government where every man and woman had equivalent, equal rights and equal responsibilities. Have we such a government today? Or is this country fast becoming to be dominated by forces that threaten the true principle of representative government? I have no desire to hear your passions or invoke an unfair argument. But we owe it to the living as well as to the dead to make honest answers to these questions. Every thinking man must have been impressed with the unsettled, restless condition of the public mind so marked in the last few years. What is it that is swelling the ranks of the dissatisfied? Is it a growing consensus in state after state that we are fast being dominated by forces that thwart the will of the people and menace representative government? Since the birth of the Republic, indeed almost within the last generation, a new and powerful factor has taken place in our business, financial and political world and is there exercising a tremendous influence. The existence of the corporation as we have with us today was never dreamed of by the fathers. The corporation of today has invaded every department of business and its powerful but invisible hand is felt in almost all activities of life. The effect of this change upon the American people is radical and rapid. The individual is fast disappearing as a business factor and in his stead is this new device, the modern corporation. The influence of this change upon character cannot be overestimated. The businessman at one time gave his individuality, stamped with his mental and moral characteristics upon the business he conducted. Today. The business once transacted by individuals in every community is in the control of corporations. And many of the men who once conducted an independent business, one, excuse me, once, and many of the men who once are conducted an independent business are gathered into organizations and all personal identity, all individualities lost. I'm well aware that the combination of capital admits of operations upon a vast scale and may cheapen production in the long run, but we pay too dearly even for cheap things and we cannot afford to exchange our independence for anything on earth. Corporations exacting large sums from the people of this state in profits upon business transacted within its limits either wholly escape taxation or pay insignificantly in comparison with the average citizen in Wisconsin. Owning two-thirds of the personal property in the, of the country, evading payment of taxes wherever possible, the corporations throw almost the whole burden up on the land upon the little homes, upon the personal pro property of the farms. This is a most serious matter, especially in the pinching times that people have suffered for the last few years. God, how patient are thy poor. These corporations and masters of manipulation and finance heaping up great fortunes by a system of legalized extortion and then exacting from the contributors to whom a little means so much, a double share to guard the treasure. So multifarious have become corporate affairs, so many concessions and privileges have been accorded them by legislation, so many more are sought by further legislation that their specially retained representatives are either elected to office directly in their interests or maintained in a perpetual lobby to serve them. Hence, 
It is that the corporation does not limit its operations to the legitimate conduct of its business. Human nature everywhere is selfish, and with the vast power which consolidated capital can wield, with the impossibility of fixing any personal or moral responsibility for corporate acts, its commands are heard and obeyed in the capitals of the state and the nation. But in a government where the people are sovereign, why are these things tolerated? Why are there no remedies promptly applied and the evils eradicated? It is because today there is a force operating in this country more powerful than the sovereign in matters pertaining to the official conduct. The official obeys whom he serves, nominated independently of the people, elected because there's no choice between candidates so nominated, the official feels responsibility to his master alone, and his master is the political machine of the party. The people whom he serves, in theory, he may safely disobey. Having the support of his political organization, he is sure of his renomination and knows he will be carried through the election because his opponent will offer nothing better to the long-suffering voter. Fellow citizens, I could have chosen a topic that would have given me much greater pleasure to discuss with you here today, but as we love our state and country, we cannot ignore the events that mark these days. Recall, if you can, a session of a legislature in any state in the Union last winter which wholly escaped charges of scandalous corruption. It will not do to say that such changes have always been made because it would not be true. Such charges 25 years ago, accompanied by legislative investigation, retired the man to private life. Not so today. So greatly has the standard of official morality deteriorated that such charges have ceased to impress the public mind. Between the people and the representatives, there has been built up a political machine which is master of both. It is the outgrowth of the caucus and convention system. In the years of business prosperity which the country experienced with the development of the great upper Mississippi Valley, men in every pursuit of life were engrossed with their individual affairs and left caucuses and con conventions wholly to the politician. When finally the pressure of hard times and the multiplying abuses in official life turned their thoughts toward needed reforms in legislation, they awoke to find themselves the mere subjects of this new master the political machine, which had come to be enthroned in American politics. They found it running their caucuses, naming their delegates, conducting their conventions, nominating party candidates, making the party platform, controlling legislatures and state administration, and fooling a majority of the people year after year with plausible explanations through the columns of its own press. Experience has proved it almost an idle folly to attend a caucus with the hope of defeating the machine until today. After a century of statesmanship and struggle and sacrifice, after all the triumphs achieved under the stars and stripes, thousands upon thousands of good citizens in every state stand aloof from the caucus and convention with the settled belief that representative government is an unqualified failure. Think of it! The citizen recognized the supremacy of the machine and abandoning the contest, the official recognizing the supremacy of the machine, obeying its orders. Why then, what then have we left? It's the very life of a republic that the law shall be made and administered by those constitutionally chosen to represent the majority. Government by the political machine is without exception the rule of the minority. When legislatures will boldly repudiate their constituents and violate the pledges of their platforms, then indeed have the servants become the masters and the people cease to be sovereign. Gone the government of equal rights and equal responsibilities. Lost the jewel of constitutional liberty. Do not look to such lawmakers to restrain corporations within proper limits. Do not look to such lawmakers to equalize the burden of taxation. Do not look to such lawmakers to lift politics out of the ways of darkness. No, begin at the foundation. Make one supreme effort, even under the present bad system, to secure a better set of lawmakers. Rally to the caucuses and conventions, each with the party in which he believes. Secure one victory, if possible, over the machine. Elect men who will pass a primary election law, which will enable the voter to sell the candidate of his choice without the intervention of caucuses or convention of the domination of the machine. Do this, 
and your officers will respond to public opinion. Do this, and the reforms you seek will be within easy reach. Oh, men, think of the heroes who died to make this country free. Think of their sons who died to keep it undivided upon the map of the world. Shall we, their children, basely surrender our birthright and say representative government is a failure? No, never, until Bunker Hill and Little Round Top sink into the very earth. Let us hear today, under this flag we all love, hallowed by the memory of all that has been sacrificed for it and for us, declare ourselves to winning back the independence of this country, to emancipating this generation and throwing off from the neck of the freemen of America the yoke of the political machine. Thank you. So that speech, was given by uh, Robert Marion La Follette, later known as, as Fighting Bob, in 1897 in Mineral Point. Both thrilling and terrifying to me that so much of what he was railing about is still true today. And uh, boy, do we need a Fighting Bob now.